Hi everyone, welcome to this week's AdvoChats. I'm excited to announce the Advocata Institute's newest project, Freedom for Her. The Freedom for Her project is a research effort by the Advocata Institute which attempts to understand Sri Lanka's dis gender discriminatory labor laws, land inheritance laws, and gender discriminatory aspects of the fiscal policy. I am Tiffany Hool, and today with me I have Naushadya Rajapaksha for this week's session. To give you a little introduction about Naushadya, she is an attorney at law at the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka, but I'm sure most of you all know her from the Yehilia Foundation. As the founder, she has conducted a series of sessions and workshops predominantly in the area of uh, women's participation and leadership. But more recently, she conducted a workshop on sexual harassment in the workplace. Thank you so much, Naushalya, for coming here today. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Tiffany. Okay. Um, so to give you a little insight as to why today's discussion is important for Sri Lanka's economy, let me give you a little context. Um, Sri Lanka's female labor force participation rate has been very low for the past few decades. Um, to quote the Department of Census and Statistics, um, their recent labor force survey uh, shows us that in the uh, recent second quarter in 2021 that the female labor force participation rate has been at 30.9 percent. This percentage has been ranging from 30 to 35 percent for the past few decades. But despite the high educational attainment in Sri Lanka of female, of, of female women, of women, we see that this hasn't transpired into the labor market. So the Advocate Institute's latest Freedom for Her project has made attempts to understand the discriminatory labor laws in Sri Lanka which hinder and discourage women from accessing the labor market or retaining, from the, uh, retaining the labor market. Um, which is why sexual harassment is identified as one of those factors. Um, so to um, get started on today's discussion, uh, Naushalya, could you tell us a little bit about Sri Lanka's current legal framework uh, on sexual harassment? Uh, Tiffany, first of all, I think that was a fantastic uh, introduction to the entire topic. And to begin with, uh, of course, when you speak of sexual harassment, sexual harassment is a recognized penal offense in our country. It's a criminal offense, so to say, in the colloquial language. But uh, of course, we in Sri Lanka only introduced sexual harassment about just 27 years ago. Only in 1995, we introduced uh, sexual harassment as an offense in our country. Now, if I now I actually brought my penal code with me just so that I could read it out loud, and that so the participants can understand how ambiguous, how unclear the provision is. So is it okay if I read it out loud? Definitely. Tell us what sexual harassment is. Is, according to our penal code. It goes on to say that whoever by assault or use of criminal force sexually harasses another person or by the use of words or conduct uh, or by the use of words or actions causes sexual annoyance or harassment to such other person commits the offense of sexual harassment. Now, Tiffany, even though, it, even though there is provision even though the criminal law has sort of acknowledged uh, the fact that sexual harassment do exist, it hasn't really defined what amounts to sexual harassment. That is one of the biggest issues that we have. Exactly. Because our law is silent and it doesn't tell you, okay, this is what sexual harassment amounts to. Whereas, as you would have heard me say, the section just simply says, okay, through actions or words, anything that causes sexual annoyance or sexual harassment amounts to sexual harassment, simple as that. So that is one of the gray areas and I'm sure that you might want to know in future what really amounts to sexual harassment also. Exactly. I, I mean, as women who enter the labor market, we would want to know if we are sexually harassed or not. And if our penal code doesn't say that, I mean, how do we go and how do we know that the law is backing us, right? Absolutely. So if I am to give a small definition in my own humble yet informed opinion as to what amounts to sexual harassment, I think sexual harassment according to the code of conduct which was published by the International Labour Organization somewhere in 2013 if I'm right. This was done, uh, this was this was a publication published by ILO together with the Employers Federation yes. of Ceylon 
and in that publication they have very comprehensively listed out ways in which you can be sexually harassed and who can sexually harass one another they are very comprehensive in that sense now we might always you know there is this misconception in our society that only women can be harassed women can be sexually harassed and i think that is wrong mm. that is completely wrong no women can be harassed by men at the workplace men can be harassed by women at the workplace supervisors can be harassed by subordinates subordinates can be harassed by supervisors you could be harassed by your own peers or you could even be harassed by third parties like non employers for an example yeah. and sexual harassment is also not just physical or just verbal it could also be virtual and gestural of course so ilo has gone to that extent of recognizing sexual harassment as to include even gestural sexual harassment and i'm sure i'm sure you might want to know in the future what it entails which we can speak about it much later on but there is also gestural there's also visual in addition to physical and verbal sexual harassment that we all know of exactly so in the light of this ambiguity and despite the fact it's criminalized in yeah. sri lanka we see that sexual harassment is still happening right, right. it's we don't see that the penal code is actually having some sort of a uh, mechanism to prevent proactively uh, uh, sexual harassment in the workplace so just to point out a few statistics for the audience and for yourself um the ilo the international labor organization conducted this massive questionnaire among 500 women who were in, un, unemployed at the time and they asked them would you all be uh, would you all be willing to go back to the labor force if you all weren't uh, you all were assured that you all wouldn't be vulnerable to sexual harassment and 3/5 of those women said they would okay. so we see that sexual harassment and the fear of sexual harassment really does hinder women from participating and entering into the labor market Another statistic that was conducted by the Sri Lanka Medical Association points out that uh, 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 free trade worker, female free trade workers in Sri Lanka, at least sixty-seven percent, sixty-two point three percent, actually have been uh, 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 perpetrated with sexual harassment. So these are just a few numbers I'm pointing out to give the audience a bit of a gravity, a uh, gravity. Uh, gravity of the situation and despite all of this you know the penal code and because this is one of the main main books in our uh, in our legal framework to sort of criminalize everything we see that it's not working right so just to follow up on this do you think um uh do you think sexual harassment should solely be addressed in a criminal context in sri lanka or is there some other avenue that the legal framework could sort of uh, direct ourselves to no not necessarily tiffany i don't think it's it's correct of us to sort of always put the ball on to the government and say okay we need new laws or we need to always reform laws no we need to first ask ourselves what can we do as an organization you know what can i mean do we have a policy within our organization to sort of combat sexual harassment that could take place within our organization do we at least have a set of good practices that we could rely on you know these are some of the things that we could always do individually and collectively as an organization rather than always having to pass the ball to the government of course if you look at this penal code this particular section that came up in that came in 1995 like i said only it i mean it's only been 27 years since sri lanka recognized the offense of sexual harassment but as a part of the explanation to this section it of course recognizes any form of sexual advances in a workplace to uh, i mean be considered as a sexual harassment but like i said earlier tiffany sexual advances are not the only form of sexual harassment now that we know there are there could be there could be virtual sexual harassment meaning you could even send somebody an email i mean and and some sort of an unwanted email which could amount to virtual sexual harassment of course and especially with covid and working from home i'm sure absolutely. that's predominant right? absolutely so that could amount to a uh, virtual sexual harassment G- gestural sexual harassment could be where you stand about 10 feet away from me but then you might make certain gestures where well, that could make me uncomfortable so i think the core question here is for us to understand what is sexual harassment what is sexual harassment why is it even a topic that you know we have to sit down and talk about today 
in my opinion i think sexual harassment is anything an action or an inaction that makes another person uncomfortable simply put okay. simply put and then unfortunately we have this certain culture in our organizations where for an example pardon me for doing this where petting you would be all right it's normalized in our cultures where you know squeezing another person and calling somebody cute and like squeezing them or like sort of you know touching them or even like you know touching their hair to whatever you know we've normalized it in our work cultures we have such a work culture where if you want to really get on board and be this friendly person you need to really sort of you know in colloquial language we say you need to be able to gel well with the people you know what i mean definitely so and by doing that unknowingly and without actually giving it giving it much thought you yourself could be a perpetrator yeah Definitely. you know that is what we need to understand because you never know how the other person feels about your actions you know your inactions of of how you are behaving now a simple pat on the back you know would be you know in terms of human resource management would be a way in which we motivate people but what if but what if the person to whom you are giving the pat to isn't comfortable with that we yeah. wouldn't know yeah and like you very correctly said you know when you speak about internal policy frameworks and reforms i mean we in sri lanka we don't have exit surveys most of the companies don't have what is called an exit survey when people resign and leave a particular organization or a company we need to have an exit survey and ask them okay why are you leaving this organization it's true they may leave for like lot of other reasons but we need to get to the bottom of it sometimes since these issues are unaddressed and unspoken you know sometimes you know you can't just go up to your colleague and be like my manager keeps patting me on my back and i feel uncomfortable and sometimes yeah since we have normalized such behavior to be comfortable mm. your colleague might tell you oh tiffany that's nothing it has been yeah. happening here for the last 20 30 years you know you should make a fuss yeah. out of it yeah. you know you shouldn't be a fuss pot mm. in our language you know could you give us a little bit more explanation about the when you said exit survey just to give the audience a bit of context exact, an exit survey is where when a person sort of resigns so either leaves or has submitted the resignation you know you can have a little bit of a question here where you question that person as to okay what are the actual reasons as to why you are leaving did you encounter any form of sexual mm-hmm. harassment while working in our organization yeah you know and and mind you sexual harassment shouldn't be limited to the sort of events and incidents that take place within the workplace it should be within the course of employment yeah. that is why as we as we go on i'm sure you might bring up this question also that is why the international labor organization harps on the phrase world of work international labor organization always i mean they don't they don't they don't necessarily rely on this 8 to 5 spectrum they've gone beyond that they've gone beyond that to sort of uh, capture that moment where the employee travels to work and mm. comes back from work yeah. so much so sexual harassment in public transport is considered as a form of harassment that employees may encounter uh, while working Yeah. So to that extent ILO has gone to that extent to capture anything that happens to the employee while they even travel to work and while they even go back from work whereas yes. our laws are very backward in that sense where we only explained and identified sexual advances as one of the ways in which you know harassment could occur at the workplace but of course there could be many other forms of harassment that takes place and answering your question also this is why just merely placing reliance on the criminal uh, or on the penal code it wouldn't do you know exactly. we need to have our internal policies we need to have our mm. set of good practices you know you might have a little youth organization it might not be as established as you know let's say as advocate for an example you know it might be a group of 10 people yeah where you you might get together and speak about some of the social issues among your friends but set out a set of good practices set out a set of good practices where you speak with one another as to okay in in our little organization in our little club and society we will make sure that nobody feels uncomfortable yes and everybody speaks up yeah. in in the event that they encounter something uncomfortable like mm-hmm. by your words or action if i feel uncomfortable this would be a safe environment mm-hmm. where i say it out loud yeah. oh simple things like that 
if we can really change if we can really inculcate to our value systems from the inception i think it will make world of difference thank you so much namshad for that very <laughs> descriptive and i think you gave the audience a lot of context about the issue at hand um so i i i completely agree with you i think that you know about, about just trying to make changes to the law yeah. won't guarantee anything um and also it is also very important to sort of tackle sexual harassment from its inception i completely agree with that and also because this is not something that's going to be a problem a problem for solely the victim yeah. we see that there's a there's done there's been a lot of research to show that sexual harassment incidents in the workplace contribute to lower productivity in those work offices right so this has an overall sort of impact on that office and the economy as a whole because if we see workplace is going lowering their productivity and uh, having untapped uh, b- b- potential b- untapped potential that means not being able to uh, b- b- g- uh, give opportunities to women we're having an overall downfall in the economy and especially in a situation like this this is the chance to sort of pivot our, b- 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 our culture as you said to sort of invite women to enter the labor market because this is such a dire time as well um so just to um because the uh, understanding all of these and understanding the changes that need to be made within the workforce and in our culture but i also want to point out the changes that we could make to the law in the long term um so under uh, so we have sort of done a lot of extensive research on uh, the the penal code and in the inadequacies of the penal code as now shall i correctly pointed out that there's a lot of gray area as to what sexual harassment is and i was wondering if you have any opinion as to what how the civil law in sri lanka could address sexual harassment not I mean I understand uh, making amendments to laws is a very very tedious task but understanding that what suggestions would you make in the long term in terms of sexual harassment in the workplace I think ratifying ILO convention 190 which came up in some in 2019 would be and absolutely would be a, would be like a very good solution if we could ratify this ILO convention because like i said earlier this ILO convention speaks about and very comprehensively explains what is the world of work and what is what is the harassment that you know your employees could go through so if we could really ratify an existing normative uh sort of a initiative which has been sort of taken internationally given the fact that it's an international treaty i feel that we will be really able to directly address this issue at hand because i feel that since 2019 only about six countries subject to correction has only ratified this ilo convention that i'm speaking about and this ilo convention is so comprehensive tiffany in such a way like i said earlier it not only captures the employer employee relationship it also captures the former employees who could be harassed by the company and also apprentices also interns also third party such as like vendors mm. you know the scope is such big and broad yeah you know they've gone to that extent of capturing all of those parties in their convention and not just that they have also identified the place of work not to be just within these four walls yes. but also they they've identified even while you're on a work trip you could be sexually harassed and that could tend to amount to sexual harassment at workplace you know mm. things that we've never really thought of yes. you know they've been very liberal in their thinking and they've really really i mean when you read the ilo convention and if you have time to read about it i think you should and you will understand the extent to which that they've gone to to sort of capture you know work trips for an example and you know things like that mm. even like you know some of the social events that your company may have sort of uh you know planned and you know have uh, executed employees could get harassed in those events also definitely which we never really think of so don't so they've gone beyond this 8 to 5 spectrum they've really captured how you know how our employees could be affected because like you very correctly said the cost of sexual harassment is not only borne by the company or by the employer or only not only by the employee there's also a cost to the society in terms of achieving justice in terms of a lot of other things yeah. so in terms of the employee like you very correctly mentioned 
you know an employee might even go to the extent of committing suicide and we wouldn't know why yeah that is how serious sexual harassment is mm. just because we are unaware of what amounts to um, just because we are unaware that another person may be uncomfortable because of your own words and inaction like i said mm. earlier tiffany you and i <coughs> sorry you and i <coughs> sorry you and i could have been you and i could have been perpetrators of sexual harassment not just merely victims mm. i've been a victim of sexual harassment at workplace but i could have also been a perpetrator yeah. by my words my actions my inactions my gestures yeah. i mean i could have certainly i could have made somebody uncomfortable without knowledge yeah definitely unconsciously i may have so we all need to be very careful and if we are to speak about creating like a safe environment if you are to talk about you know having an environment where employees are you know free to engage in their occupation of choice freely and you know in such a manner where there are equal opportunities for people where there is no discrimination at workplace then sexual harassment must be taken into account and steps to eradicate and combat sexual harassment must certainly be not just considered must also be implemented and not just implemented it must also be reviewed monitored and necessary steps must be taken to also reimplement it thank you so much ma'am shall you forget that explain a lot um so we have a few questions uh, that are that are coming from the instagram live i'm just going to point out one to you um going to the human resource department at times is not uh, uh not helpful what options do women have in instances such as this First of all I feel that if you ever encounter any form of harassment at workplace the first thing you must do is to acknowledge that what you are going through is harassment right. that is the first step to sexual harassment is to acknowledge and accept that what you are going through is harassment mm. because not many people do that mm. people always overlook it and be like oh come on this has been the company's practice for 20 30 years you know boss coming in and just you know giving this pat on your back or on your butt oh that's fine come on he has mm. been doing this for the longest time or oh, she has been doing this for the longest time come on you've got to you know get on board with mm. it you know you can't be this you know this person you know you can't be a fuss pot here mm. you know because of such sentiments that we tend to carry and inculcate in mm. your work peers you know what happens is we always overlook when harassment takes place Mm. So first of all you need to ask yourself wherever if you if you do work ask yourself even if even if you don't work even if you are a student ask yourself okay where are you wherever you work or wherever you are engaged in ask yourself whether you feel comfortable being there whether you feel comfortable working there or engaging with the peers yeah. or is there anything that that the peers do or say that makes you uncomfortable that is mm. your first step Right. acknowledging and accepting that you feel uncomfortable then you would know that you are being harassed that's number 1 okay secondly let's take like a hypothetical workplace situation secondly if you after you acknowledge and after you understand okay i've been i've i've been getting harassed you know i feel uncomfortable mm. i don't feel like coming to work my mm. productivity has sort of gone down because of this you know because of them cracking jokes mm. even cracking jokes about your attire about yeah. your appearance that still amounts to harassment for example because it makes you feel so uncomfortable it makes right? you feel so uncomfortable yeah. you know sometimes you have to block yeah. your own peers from social media just because of their exactly. just because of the questions that they might ask you which you which makes you feel so uncomfortable and i think that I'm just sorry to no interrupt no here no and i think that a lot of our audience is probably you know very recently have entered into the labor force yeah. right so we will have interns apprentices and there's so there's so many there's so much hierarchy in sri lanka in our so workforce. many bureaucracies yeah i mean you would know this right and like i mean like in our legal uh, like our legal career and our legal profession there's so much hierarchy that we do we feel the fear to kind of speak out even though the law is telling us to advocate for absolutely things, right? and then and then people always use social media to sort of you know taint a person's character and reputation mm. we don't really make that personal life work like work life segregation you know for an example your work peers might go through your social media and then have a bad impression about you and not really understand you okay this is somebody's personal life yeah, and that who you are as a person socially has no bearing on your productivity of you mm. as an individual at Definitely. work 
Definitely. But then since we have this culture of sort of judging people and mm-hmm. sort of to make fun out of people, like I said earlier, in terms of their appearance, in terms of their attire, which could all amount to harassment. Mm. Right, so we need to be very careful with all of that. So like I said earlier, first of all, acknowledge and accept that you're being harassed. And secondly, secondly, remember, confront. Mm. You need to confront the perpetrator directly Mm. rather than going to the human resource management department. Confront the perpetrator directly. Inform that person verbally and in a very comprehensive manner that whatever you're doing or saying or not doing is making me uncomfortable, don't do this. Okay. It's very simple. Could I just interject? Of course, yeah. please. Um, so I have, you know, I have spoken to a few women who have been, uh, who have been faced with sexual harassment by their boss. Okay. And uh, they have attempted to sort of, you know, uh, confront their bosses about it, but they're so... I, I, I'm not generalizing in terms of men, right? Yes. Um, this could be anyone, a exactly. woman or a man. But I think that, that they, being in such high position sometimes creates a bubble. And they are so unaware that this is wrong. Um, so they might think that, you know, this is... Uh, they, they are more um, ignorant about these things. So what if, what if that confrontation doesn't work, is my question. Then we go to step number three. Okay. After you confront and inform the perpetrator, that I'm going to use the word perpetrator because this person could be a woman, this person could be a man, this person could be an intern, a subordinate, mm-hmm. even your supervisor. This person could be anybody at work. This person could be uh, the one, I mean, this person could be anybody. So I'm going to refer to this person as a perpetrator. And of course, if that doesn't work, if confrontation doesn't work, the third step would be for you to, in writing, of course, we all send emails to one another at workplace, in writing, inform that person that whatever you're doing is making me feel uncomfortable and it's mm. affecting me adversely. Mm. Simple. But, there's a but there. Make sure that you copy your personal mm. email address when you send this email. Now, why is that? Because they if you control. leave, yes. when you leave this place of work, you have you will have no access to this particular email that you would be sending the perpetrator. So it's imperative that you copy it to your personal email address also when you send this email. That's step number three. But even after this, if it doesn't work, you might ask me, okay, now what do we do? Step four. Then step four would be for you to go to the human resource management department mm. and to submit a complaint in writing. Mm. There's another but there. <laughs> but make sure when you submit this complaint to the human resource management department that you keep a copy of this complaint with you. you. And on this complaint, try and get the date stamp, try and get some signature from anybody in charge of the HR department to the effect that they receive this complaint mm. to the effect that they receive this complaint and that they would be working on get 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 it minuted in other mm. words get it minuted so you would have some proof to the effect that you've tried all channels you've confronted the person you've you, you've written him an email you've tried i mean and then you've gone to the human resource management department because afterwards if it doesn't work now of course i'm talking about a very rudimental situation where you're not being sexually assaulted but of course, where the actions of the perpetrator are sort of at a very basic level in comparison to like sexual assault or rape. That is the sort of situation mm-hmm. I'm referring to. Yeah. Of course, if you have been raped or if you are being sexually assaulted at your workplace, then you shouldn't wait for this long. You need to mm-hmm. immediately go to the police and make the necessary complaint. Yeah. But of course, if this is something that you feel that could be avoided, Mm. if this is something you feel that the perpetrator could sort of reform, Mm. then this is the sort of procedure that you could adhere to if you are interested. And then make sure you have this copy with you because if you go to the police to make a complaint under section 345 of the penal code, then you could show to the police how you've gone through all the steps. Okay. How you inform the person, mm. how you've written him an email, how you even inform the human resource management department of it and how no action was taken with this regard. Right. So that is very important and always have copies of the complaints, mm. have copies of the emails. That is very important. I must also mention here, Tiffany, Third party intervention in terms of sexual harassment at workplace is super vital. If your colleague is getting harassed at your workplace, 
do not keep shut mm. you know always intervene mm. you know if you feel that your colleague no matter how old or how senior how junior this colleague could be if you feel that that person is you know made to feel uncomfortable in a certain situation always take the necessary steps to intervene to stand up and always sort of encourage your peers to make the necessary complaints also and to st- and, and to sort of follow a certain procedure like we just mm. mentioned that is very important don't overlook sexual harassment and be like oh it's not my problem i'm not the one who got harassed so why the i mean why the hell i should i be bothered yeah don't be like that yeah that that was so comprehensive thank you so much i think that was the perfect sort of advice we could give to our instagram audience because if you mm. are sort of going through this in your workplace these are the steps you can take to minimize the uh, the, the the lack of evidence right absolutely you know just to make sure that you have sort of uh, 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 inscribed every step that you have taken to protect yourself but also how you spoke about the police i'd like to point out a few of the inadequacies in sort of addressing sexual harassment in a criminal context i know that you mentioned that you know we shouldn't uh, deviate the, take the put the burden on the the state all the time but it's important to also scrutinize existing legal frameworks right yes. and systems um so to give you a, a very comprehensive context um sexual harassment is highly unreport underreported in sri lanka despite the numbers that i pointed out to you um this is because that um in sri lanka we are meant to have a a a a, a woman a female officer police officer at every police station yes this ha- however is not consistent in every police station uh that's one thing uh but d- despite this even if we do have a female police officer we see that the police station is the infrastructure and their sort of uh, uh, their sort of mechanisms to address uh, 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 complaints is more uh, is more uh, accommodative to graver uh, offenses like rape and murder so when they when they take down a complaint saying oh someone you know touch my skirt or or squeeze my butt yes. uh, 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 they they would be like this is not so serious maybe you should you know handle it uh, handle it within your workplace maybe it's because of what you wore maybe it's because of what you wore <laughs> Maybe and it's your fault after all <laughs> exactly and these are these are sort of the responses that we men have sort of been faced with when they enter uh, the police station and obviously they are not coming there you know because they felt like it was uh, not important Absolutely. they they definitely felt victimized for them to even get the courage to take a step to the police station right um so just given the context of the police station and the sort of grave uh, complaints that they take out, take down every day this seems like a gray area right i'm not undermining sexual harassment at all yes. i'm just saying that it's not it's not rape it's not murder <clears throat> it is somewhere in the middle so because of the sort of nature of sexual harassment and the and the way in which the police station is sort of uh, uh, mechanized to take down complaints and the attitudes of uh, uh, i'm not generalizing yeah, again absolutely. the 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 attitude of you know the, the officers it would be such that women feel uh, women or men feel uh, afraid to come forward with their complaints to the police because they might feel that okay is anything going to happen at all exactly the, the actually that's a good point right so you make your complaint to the police and then you are followed with you know you'll have to investigate into it and if at all it'll turn into a court proceeding yes court proceedings you and i both know very long tedious costly um there's a lot of things that will follow up with that and how does it affect your workplace relationship now does it uh, does it secure your 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 position in in your office no does it make it every ever it will make it so much more awkward uh, if at all even if you are able to retain that position right Absolutely. so these are a lot of factors that we have sort of considered as advocate to understand as to whether sexual harassment should solely be addressed in a criminal context uh, we understand that uh, b- b- internally internally there needs to be a strengthening of infrastructure to combat proactively combat sexual harassment in officers which is why i want to ask you more specifically how the ilo convention sort of addresses this trying to make internal changes as well as outside changes in the law so ilo convention actually 
it encourages internal reform so to say it not only puts the burden on the state but it also gets just public and private organizations to sort of implement some of the core values of the ILO convention like I said which is an international treaty that is there to sort of end any form of violence that individuals or individuals may uh, face in the world of work but of course coming back to your question now the question was also rather on the line of okay will there be any point in making this complaint hmm. or going to the police yes. also and, and and how does these international conventions how have they helped hmm. what we need to understand tiffany is that even though we have all of these normative standards that we can follow and all of these international initiatives that we can look up to and sort of you know localize it to the local context we need to do that with a little bit of caution mm. because our culture our sort of context is very much different to the sort of countries who have probably who have already ratified ILO convention mm. 190 like you said very correctly the sort of see sometimes the police officials some of them not most yeah. of them some, yeah. of them some of them may not be trained enough or effectively yes. to sort of handle a complaint of sexual harassment exactly yes. because unlike grave uh, sexual offenses such as rape or incest or gang rape or like any form of sexual assault sexual harassment is not palpable mm. how do you make a complaint and say okay somebody kissed me or somebody just put a pat on my back or squeezed me like even if you are subjected to a judicial medical officer to get a report and come a medical exactly. report and come the medical report is not going to indicate ah okay so you've been kissed or oh, ah, okay so you've been squeezed or patted mm. so sexual harassment unlike the other offenses are not really palpable right so you can't really touch it so that's why police personnel may feel that you know they might feel that okay this is something that you can sort out at your workplace mm -hmm. so to curtail that only i i suggested earlier that you can go through these steps for an example i told you earlier how you can first confront the individual how you can first write to the individual and then go to the human resource management department before you go to the police so when you go to the police and when the police be like Okay, this is something you can solve internally. Mm -hmm. You can show to the police how you tried all of that, but how none of it really worked. Does that make sense? Yes. And how do, how none of that really worked. So you can sort of bring up all of that uh, onto place. So again, coming back to Tiffany's question, we cannot just randomly and single-handedly think of ratifying international treaties and conventions. We can't do that. Mm. If we are to sort of, you know, bring these conventions on board, we need to think of ways in which we can actually localize some of it to fit our culture. If I if I am to sort of deviate from the topic, Tiffany. Yeah. Now, see, uh, see, I think I mentioned earlier about sexual harassment in public transport. Yes. Now, we have, now of course, this is this being the only criminal provision in our country mm -hmm. that recognizes sexual harassment as a penal offense as a criminal offense this is silent on sexual harassment in public transport yet 90 percent of the women according to the un survey exactly says that they have been experienced and me myself right exactly there isn't i can't i can't think of a single person especially women especially I, i'm not going to say only women have encountered sexual harassment but especially women and young girls at least once in their lifetime if you are ever commuted uh, you know through public and by using public transport you have certainly mm. been exposed to at least would have witnessed other people getting harassed while traveling yeah. now let's let's let, let's take that for an example okay. now now to sort of combat sexual harassment in public transport they came up with a hotline mm. they came up with a hotline where you could call this particular hotline and inform them okay i'm getting sexually harassed mm. what can i do but the moment you call this hotline, unfortunately, what happens is the first question they ask you is, okay, what is the bus number? How do we know the bus number? What, what, what is the bus number? Would you know? No. Okay, second question. Can you identify the perpetrator? Now, the person who has probably put a jack on you, are you going to be like, I, 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 can I just know your name and your ID card number, please? I would like to make a police complaint. <laughs> now, does that happen? Can it practically happen? No, no it's not. It's impractical. Yeah. 
right so these are some of the issues so and 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 it's fair by the police and the legal authorities to ask you these questions because otherwise without you providing this information they can't of course you know maintain or sort of proceed legal action because legal action should be proceeded against a natural person thereby you need to recognize the person mm -hmm. So now see the impracticalities of sort of you know blindly sort of by bringing sort of international good practices and initiatives of having a hotline to call mm. that didn't really solve the issue yeah. to date people are exposed to sexual harassment because of which some people have had suicidal thoughts some people have had depression anxiety so sexual harassment i feel that it's a broad concept like mm. ilo has recognized like you very correctly said in the world of work you shouldn't only look at this 8 to 5 spectrum mm -hmm. you need to go beyond mm -hmm. even from the time your employee leave their respective home to come to your place of work and from your place of work until the time they go back home you should be in charge you need to make sure that she or he or anybody amidst their genders and different sexes are safe yeah and that you need to enable a safe environment in the best way possible and merely waiting for the government to sort of merely awaiting the government to sort of make the changes wouldn't really you know solve the issue yeah and i think this actually uh, answers one of the questions that we've got that we have gotten from our ig live the ilo is a tripartite uh, tripartite uh, between the state employers and trade unions therefore shouldn't we consider it and i think you have mentioned that we definitely should right absolutely okay so let's we can move on from that um also just a few thoughts on what you just mentioned you know like uh, personally like when we we've all created our own mechanisms to like yeah. sort of combat sexual harassment in public transport right so right now like you know i remember my pair, my mother used to say how we used to, how they used to carry a pin yes. in the bus and uh, prevent uh, like on the way to work at least to yes. prevent themselves from being sexually harassed now the new thing is coughing in front of someone if they approach you too closely so i mean you know this the stories go on no nothing has been addressed properly and we we are still waiting for these changes in culture in legal aspects everything right mm. um so i think we have sort of covered a lot of the things uh, that we have to discuss today we have covered the ilo uh, ilo convention we have discussed the current legal framework in sri uh, in sri lanka thank you so much navshadia for explaining that so comprehensively <laughs> and we've also given the audience a good advice about how do you uh, how do you manage sexual harassment if you were you were victimized right um so just to wrap up uh, uh, all of this i have one last question for you uh, do you have any uh, it will be a very short uh, answer i'm uh, i i i think but um, do you have any final thoughts regarding how the uh, this low number in female labor force participation rate uh, do you have any thoughts on this um and how sexual harassment should be sort of addressed in the light of this female labor force participation rate do you have any thoughts on it um there is see 52% of this country's population comprises of women right and then if you look at the numbers statistically you will understand that more young girls are sort of studying in english medium than boys in this country and most of them if you take the university enrollment numbers statistically speaking still women have top that list also if you go to a if you go to a some sort of a graduation ceremony you will always see 60% at least 60% of them are women mm. but like you asked me i mean but the question is in terms of sort of this transition from education to workplace there's a huge gap to date we have only like a 70 to 30% gap in workforce but why i think sexual harassment in workplace like you very correctly mentioned at the very outset is one of the biggest factors it's one of the biggest rather one of the most prevalent forms of violence that young especially women and young girls face so to ensure that any place that a woman or a young girl speci especially a young a woman or a young girl again i'm not trying to discriminate boys or men 
but especially women and young girls work if you could make it a safe environment where when she works and even afterwards even after work when she is to travel back home and even at the social events to social gatherings to all of the other things that are connected to work if you can make sure that she's safe i think retention of you know good employees you know such such star employees at your workplace wouldn't be a problem and i think in terms of improving our numbers this is important that we not only take state initiatives but that we also take whatever the initiative however simple it is mm-hmm. to make sure that there is you know that there is there is not just freedom for her but also that there's a safe environment for her unless and otherwise we do that i really don't think getting the numbers high uh, would be a possibility Thank you so much now Sharia to everyone who joined thank you so much for being a part of this session um thank you now Sharia you gave us such a comprehensive uh, explanation about the whole topic today and Most i'm very, very grateful for you to for you to have to have you on board at the advocata studio um so to just conclude um stay t- uh, stay tuned to advocata for more content on gender discriminatory labor laws covering overtime work part time work and night time work in sri lanka um and if you want to you know be a part of this movement and this series uh have, you can always tag us on our instagram page and hashtag #freedom for her alerted <coughs> nidhasa and alerted nidhasa thank you so much everyone and have a good night